Good morning, afternoon, and evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in this tutorial, we're going to go over how to color grade your new uh, A6300 um, footage that you have shot via S-Log2 or S-Log3 in your A6300. I'm sure you're all very excited about this camera. Um, you're probably not so excited about the rolling shutter, but I can tell you that this camera is amazing for a thousand bucks. So what I've done is I've imported some footage in here that I've shot with my friend Jack out in downtown Chicago. And I'm going to show you how to color grade this stuff so that uh, you can use it. Now, what you commonly see online is people uh, just grabbing the S-Log3 footage or S-Log2 footage and just grading it, you know, in any program with some color correction tools in Premiere or Final Cut. And they don't even realize that they're actually doing voodoo uh, color correction in the essence that they need to take a s-log uh you know curve and actually convert it to um to get all that data back so what you end up getting is footage online of really nasty looking shadows and really nasty looking uh like blown out highlights and then their shadows are looking real muddy and i, I don't know what it looks like but it looks terrible so um what's important is if we will tell you that you really want to be working in a system that supports 32-bit based workflow uh, or float based workflow in converting this information because it's going to pop out of the normalized value of zero to one, zero meaning black, one meaning white, and then you got to kind of squeeze all that data back down into the zero to one kind of uh, space. So what we're going to do is show you how to do that inside of Premiere. I'm using Premiere Pro CC and this is through this new tool called Lumetri that's inside of CC. Um, so let's go ahead and take this clip here. This is my friend Jack. Uh, we, are, uh, we wanted to shoot this really cool scene, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take him and I'll go ahead and grab it. Actually, I'll take this clip right here. This was S-Log3. Um, again, shooting through Windows is one reason why you should be shooting with uh, S-Log2 or 3. So I'm going to go ahead and take this, and I'm going to go ahead and drag it on this little uh, page here, and that's going to make a new timeline here. And I'm going to go ahead and just zoom in on this. Uh, it's a little bit bogged down because I'm recording a very high resolution on my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and take this and clip and do unlink so I don't have to hear the audio. I can I could just, you know, come over here and turn off the audio, but whatever. So here's my friend Jack and we are eating at a restaurant and you got these windows that are extremely blown out in the interior, mixing color temperatures by the way. Uh, this is, you know, exterior, you know, 5600 temperature and then interior, uh, you know, tungsten or whatever you want to call it, somewhere around 3200, maybe some, you know, whatever you want to call it, incandescence or fluorescence possibly, all types of fun, right? So, okay, so here's the footage itself, and uh, usually with S-Log2, they'll tell you to overexpose. I usually put, set my zebras to 100 plus on the A6300, and, and then uh, keep bumping up my exposure until I see zebras on something out here that's very bright, and then I back it off, so I don't clip the highlights. Um, it's important to get as high and hot as possible. There is a uh, sort of a LUT a gamma LUT adjuster inside of A6300 that you can actually see a kind of a rough graded version of when you're filming S-Log2 and S-Log3 uh, but it you know whatever I mean it's it's best for your judgment so here's the shot itself we have a very dimly dark shadow area in here and then we have a very blown out area outside so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this footage and you can see under Lumetri color if you ever want to get to this you just come over here to your uh, Windows, Workspace, and you want to choose Color, and your Lumetri option will come up. This is like a mini DaVinci Resolve inside of your computer. It is awesome. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, used to have trouble, had to go to, say, jump over to DaVinci Resolve, grade their pieces, export those pieces out, and then bring it in to Premiere, which is a good workflow, going from, say, Premiere to DaVinci Resolve and back, or speed grade and back. That's the common workflow. But if you really want to get just a quick workflow, this is it here. So um, what you'll see here is the Lumetri color, and I'll click click on a clip, and then all of a sudden there is an option here to do something. I want you to be aware that under effect controls there is no Lumetri effect added, but the minute I come in here under the look and click on it, uh, and if I add something, it's going to do that. Now, um, again, just looking at this look, it is what it is, right? If I go ahead and take a look at it, if I pull this down. There's all these different options here for Kodak and, and all this fun stuff. If you come over here and just take a look at the basic color correction option, you have input LUT. Uh, right now it's set to none. We have to convert this uh, S-Log3 or S-Log2 information into a, uh, into a specific LUT to get the information. 
So I'm going to go ahead and take this, and this was shot with S-Log3, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on this. It's commonly told that S-Log3 will create banding, little gradient bars in uh, blue sky. It's true, I've seen it. Uh, but most circumstances, it actually works pretty well. So if you're not shooting on a bright blue sky day and you got the sky in your shot, uh, then you won't have a problem. If there's clouds in the shot, you should be fine. Um, if not, use S-Log2. People are using S-Log2, and it works just as fine. Or if you want to shoot Cine4, uh, just set your picture profile to Cine4, and then your uh, Gamma2, Gamut3, uh, dot uh, Cine. And that way you can shoot with, uh, it's almost like a little bit of a dealing with the highlights, and then you can do a little quick grade on it, a light grade, and actually it'll work fine as well. People are using, uh, including Philip Bloom has requested and said, across the board A7S, A7S2, A6300 shooting, Cine4 will still maintain pretty much the same amount of dynamic range. Um, as S-Log2 and S-Log3, which opens the door to ISO such as 200 and eight, uh, all the way to 800, which is useful, right? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put this to S-Log3. Commonly people tell you to overexpose S-Log2 and S-Log3. Yes, you might want to do that, get those shadows up a little bit. So once you do that, um, this converts it over. And now we're looking at this through uh, converted or uh, LUT. So I'm going to go ahead and show you now that it's popped up here. I have lumetri color. All the same options are in here. I prefer to keep this stuff on the right-hand side to play with and have my scopes available so I can see them. These are your scopes. It is commonly known that a skin tone should be about 50, as you can see here. And Jack, is this goes from left to right on the screen. So as I crawl across here, you'll see we get this little divot hill, and that's Jack. He's under lit. And then we come down here, and it gets a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter. So um, I need to bring him up so that his exposure is a little bit better. So I'll take exposure, and what this does, it sort of puts a pivot point here and scales up this here. It's a multiplication process. So 0 times 0 equals 0, so no change. 0 times 5, you know, uh, you know, 1 times 4 equals 2 times 2 equals 4. So it's going to kind of go up, but the blacks are going to, absolute blacks are going to stay put. So I'm going to go ahead and take exposure. And you can see it's basically scaling from this point down here. And I can bring that up, and I'm trying to get him about 0.5. Now Jack is properly exposed. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take my highlights. And this is where we start to deal with stuff like contrast. Contrast is crushing the blacks and whites. So if I do this, if I go ahead and crush this, you can see this is expanding the top and the bottom almost from the center pivot point. But the minute that these, this hill here touches 100, those uh, areas are going to be blown out, like 90, 100. You can see like... Boom, it's going to get blown out. Now, we don't want to do that, right? Not just yet. We want contrast, but we want to have all this information sort of shoved in here, okay? Uh, the other thing we can do is, I'll just go ahead and put this back to zero for now, is highlights. Highlights are going to just affect the highlights and bring them down. So you see any hot spot here, it'll actually cook it down, but it's going to kind of hold back on the midtones and the uh, shadow areas. So this is usually called your shoulder. If you want to know where this is at, if you go to curves, Curves, uh, like if I were to make a point here, this is your shoulder. This is usually, this area is usually called your knee. Okay, so you can see if I take this and bring this down, it's sort of doing the same thing. It's going to bring the data down on this, these highlights here. It's still not really touching the absolute whites right here to a certain degree. And then here is what's called your knee, and if you lift this up, you're actually lifting up the shadow areas, but you're not touching your absolute blacks, okay? So that, the, the little operation I just did right here, bringing up the knee, is the same thing as taking your shadow area and doing this. So if I bring up my, bring the shadows up, I'm basically bringing that knee up. So you can see all the shadow areas are being sort of filled in, okay? If I want to crush the whites, it's going to take the brightest value of white and then start to uh, not so bright and then eventually down to grayscale and black and turn those to pure white values of 1.0. So you see it's going to crush it, crush it, crush it, crush it. You probably over crank this too. So I don't want to do that. And then blacks, we go the opposite direction, it's going to start crushing black. So if I just pull this down, you can see all these are pure values of zero. Remember everything is from the value of zero to one. Zero meaning black, then you know 0.5 is like grayscale. And then one is white, the color white, okay? Saturation, big time. Uh, most people don't saturate their images. Now, uh, you gotta be careful with saturation because you can turn into an Oompa Loompa very quickly. So what, what I like to do is come in here and play with Vibrance. Vibrance sort of 
to a certain degree will uh, bring in saturation, but kind of be careful with the mid tone slash you know you know the, the actual skin tones and so forth. It's a little bit easier than saturation. Saturation is going to actually hit up universally the mid tones, highlights, and shadows under saturation. So you can see the difference here. Jack's face is not an oompa loompa, but the rest of the image is saturated. If I come over here to saturation here. You can see even the blacks are getting a color treatment of saturation, which uh, if you want to have that ugly look of uh, what I consider ugly, it may not be ugly to you, but saturated blacks where they're, they're, they're super red or super blue, uh, no thank you. So I like vibrance. Vibrance is a nice touch, kind of bring up the colors. I still think Jack is extremely not that contrasty, um, so I'm going to actually crush, crush him a little bit um, in a minute. Um, you got color wheels, so if you want to adjust midtones, highlights, and shadows individually, you can do that. So if you want to bring up your shadows, your highlights, your midtones, there's also this nice little thing called vignette. If you want to put some vignette in there, uh, the amount you know the darker it gets, it has a nice filmic look to it. Usually, this is seen in dark situations where not a lot of light is getting around the corners of a lens, uh, whereas the most light is getting to the center of the lens. The roundness and the feathering, really cool kind of filmic-y look going on. If you want film, I highly recommend spending 200 bucks. It's probably cheaper now, but if you go under, uh, if you, you can download a demo of this just to play with it, it'll have a watermark, but Film Convert Pro will actually give you film emulsions. It's very, very uh, helpful. Um, you can actually build .cube files out of DaVinci Resolve uh, looks, basically, that you prefer, and you can bring them into Premiere, which I'll kind of do a tutorial in the future on. Um, so first off, let me kind of grade this to the point where eventually what I, I like it. So I'm going to take this and I'll come to contrast, add some contrast here. So we get a little bit more of that Batman Dark Knight look, whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's make sure there's something happening here. I think it is. It's just so subtle. There we go. So again, Jack is underlit, and this is where lights come, in, come into play. You guys have his camera now, right? You get the low light pretty close to A7S II. Don't be a lazy bum. Go out and buy a light um, and let your scene. When I use lighting, it's 10,000 times better. So get a very uh, well-graded uh, LED light. Uh, the uh, Photo Deox has a circular light that's around 600 bucks, 500 bucks. Well worth it. You don't get a green cast in it, and it's cool because it's an LED light. So again, this is just a look. I could come in here and create a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more work here. I'm not going to get into all these details. There is more information to play with, or just options when you use DaVinci Resolve, and it's free. DaVinci Resolve Lite is free. You learn it. There's some great tutorials on it. Don't be a lazy bum. Learn, learn, learn. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, LUTs. You'll find a lot of LUTs out. Uh, 3D LUTs, which are better than 1D LUTs. Okay. If you want to use any of those, so I'm going to go ahead and take this Lumetri color. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it, all right? And now if I just take this clip, we're going to add a look, but this time we're going to take it from a file that I have linked below. I'm going to hit Browse, and this was taken by uh, Casey Wilson's website. He has this incredible LUT that he uses, mostly from stuff that he pulls off an of Atomo Shogun, um, but it's uh, you can download it. It's a .cube file, and I'll just go ahead and... Put this in. This is usually for S log two footage, though. So I'm actually taking S log three and putting a S log two uh, based LUT on it. But that's okay. I can take this now and play around. Again, coming back to my Luma, uh, Lumetri scopes. Again, uh, you want to take a look at it, and you can adjust your uh, colors. Uh, usually, not to say all the time, but usually these three bars um, will definitely uh, should kind of overlap a little bit. If I come over here to say my, uh, let's go back to my basic color correction. You see, if I adjust the temperature and I shift the temperature off, you see you get this difference in the colors of the parade here of these three different options. See, there's more red here than green than blue, as obviously that's seen in my shot. So one of the things to tell to adjust slightly adjust temperature again. This isn't raw, but you can do slight adjustments. Um, is to kind of play around and look for this to overlap to the color of white. And when that happens, then you got a rough color grade. You know, it's it's not all the case. Maybe your scene has an orange tinge to it. Okay, and then tint. Sometimes footage has a green tint or a yellow tint. I've done uh, I've shot with red before, and there's always a little bit of adjustments with magenta and green. So if you find that there's a little bit too much 
uh, magenta in the shot, you can shift towards green on the color wheel. So here you can get a whole different type of look on here, which looks kind of cool. Again, this is a very underlit shot, eating at a Noodles & Company in downtown Chicago at the Chase Building right behind us. So anyway, so all these fun little tools you can work on. Um, please like and subscribe. I have more tutorials coming mostly in the realm of VFX. I'm the VFX supervisor for feature films, and I'm working on a big feature film right now called Thrill Ride. So I um, and can't wait to get that finished and keep moving here. So with that said, I think that kind of covers everything. Enjoy your A6300. One last thing I want to recommend to you if you're shooting with the A6300. Obviously, uh, image stabilization, get a gimbal. I have a link to all types of tools that I use. Uh, gimbals, um, uh, wireless mics, and so forth. But the big one, if you're going to be using anything with fast motion, obviously, is you're going to get rolling shutter or, or the jello effect. And you really don't whine about it. Just shoot conservatively with the tool that you have, and then under distort, use the rolling shutter repair and just drop that onto your uh, filter. And then you have the option of either using warp, which actually works pretty well, so like a universal warp, or pixel motion if you're doing 3D or CG stuff. Uh, it'll take the pixels per pixel value and change it. You can get some swirly artifacts, but no biggie. Warp actually works just well, um, which is really nice. So you, it'll fix, to a certain degree, the rolling shutter effect. Um, uh, tempor it'll use temporal-based uh, workflow. It's a little bit, again, voodoo uh, work as far as doing 3D, track 3D tracking stuff. But that's it. So definitely check out the, the links below um, and just you know write any comments. I'll be glad to get back to you guys. And I will have a workflow coming very soon for DaVinci Resolve um, if you're interested.